Whoa, what the fuck is up, YouTube? I don't know what the fuck I'm doing, man. But I want to be on YouTube. I want to make YouTube videos that you can only watch on YouTube, that I don't put on TikTok. And I kind of want to make those videos whatever I want them to be. And I'd be curious what you'd want to want to, to see from me. I want to make sketches myself. I have sketch ideas I want to shoot and edit and publish on here. I have all kinds of stuff I want to do. Um, you know? Oh, I just realized. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, you know, some YouTubers, they wear masks. And I was going to try out if that maybe works for me. But I'm not really feeling it. I kind of like... You know, you could see my face. Okay, well, let me pull. I'll pull up my fucking letterbox. I'll pull up my letterbox. Man, that, that's what this video will be. What movies have I watched recently? I'll get to the movies I watched, but that's the first one I watched is Rules of the Game. You know, it's like, I'm pretty sure that got like a re-release in New York in like the 50s. And that came out in 1939. And, the, and, and re-released in New York because motherfuckers in France were re-releasing it because they were, they were re-appreciating it later. The, the budding sort of French New Wave people were appreciating it as early as the 50s, I guess. I don't know, I might be mixing up details. There's people who are sticklers about shit like this, so I'm just leaving room for error here. But anyhow, like, major premieres happen in New York all the time. Of everything. It's historical, dude. It's been around way longer than fucking any other city, you know what I'm saying? In the fucking country. It's like the first fucking city. It's crazy. It's like the capital of the Western world. It's wild. And I'm not like a Western chauvinist. I'm not like, look at the beautiful nation. We have. You know, I'm not like that. I don't give a fuck. But I'm saying like depth, the continuity here is wild. Is wild. You can't, you can't take that out of a place. There's ghosts. You know what I mean? There's ghosts here. Yeah, man. So I just really love living here and going to see movies. I try to see movies in theaters as much as possible. I try to see movies at home. The big thing is, is I have crippling if you couldn't tell by the fucking stuffed animals and, and video game posters, I have crippling ADHD, right? So it is hard for me to watch a film front to back. Like today, for example, I started watching Ace in the Hole. I was going to rent it for fucking like 50 cents more. You could buy it. What is the point of that then? Why even? Okay. I bought it. Whatever. The Billy Wilder film, right? Ace in the Hole. Like within the first five minutes, I was like, this is going to be a fantastic picture this is going to be phenomenal i was like i paused it i was like you know what i'm watching this fucking tomorrow i'm watching this tomorrow i might even wait for my girlfriend to be available to watch this because i know this is going to be gas i want to watch this with her i was like i was like all right time to lock in and then like 10 minutes in i'm like i want to pause this actually <laughs> so i don't want to deal with that right i like the commitment of having to go to the theater i have to go into manhattan to see all the movies i see so it's a it's not a hike, but, you know, it's a commitment. You know, you're getting on the train and going in. And luckily, it, a lot of them are really not that far from me. So, as I mentioned, that was the first film I saw. I saw this movie, Rules of the Game. And Rules of the Game is funny, man. Uh, because that movie, personally, to me, has a lot of clout from an early point. Uh, because an older, smarter, way more literate uh, cinephile that I met when I was probably 17 at Tulsa's, um, University of Tulsa's film camp was hyping up that one. He was like, oh, that film's brilliant. He loved, he loved like pre post war, like forties, thirties, fifties, French, like, well, I don't know how to describe it, but it's like Jean Renoir and Marcel Carnier. He loved both those guys. And I feel like they made movies around during the war time. But anyhow, Jean Renoir also, by the way, his dad is Renoir, the fucking French imp impressionist painter. Like he's the man, which is crazy because Jean Renoir is the man. You know, this movie had, like like I said, a, a clout. It was like, oh, this is one of the best movies fucking ever. And I have already seen it. I saw it, like, probably when I was 18. But I really hadn't seen it since then. Um, and I feel like no matter what, the more you, films you watch and the older you get. And, it, I mean, if you personally, like, think often and, and really, like, think deeply about cinema a lot like no matter what if you haven't seen a film in 10 years and you come back to that shit you're gonna have new insights or just feelings about it and 
it did feel like I was watching it for the first time. I definitely didn't appreciate it. Uh, uh, the second time I watched Citizen Kane is when it fucking really dug deep as one of my favorite films. And I rewatched it recently, like last fall, and it felt like I watched it for the first time. And it was like, what the fuck, dude? This movie's hilarious. This movie is so good. It's so entertaining. It's a riot, dude. It's a fucking... It's like watching Star Wars. It's like so entertaining. It's like an adventure film. So coming back to this one, I was very excited. And I was like reading about it on the way there. And yeah, it came out in 1939 and it was shit on. They shat on it. They fucking pooped on it. They were like, this is garbage. Jean Renoir, this is garbage. What are you doing? They were wrong. And he... In the he re-released it, I think, and the sight and sound poll for like greatest films of all time that they've been doing like every ten years or whatever since 1952. In 1952, it was like in top ten, which is crazy because it got shot on before, and then now they're like, actually, this is a masterpiece. So total second wind it got, and then it has stayed at that status culturally since then. And what's funny is it very much is kind of like. All those movies where it's just like a bunch of like bougie friends hanging out in a place and kind of being sort of sad and having interpersonal drama and it's like takes place over one night or weekend or whatever like and it and it like maybe even kind of highlights the class disparity between them and some of the people like maybe they're really rich and they're servants and stuff and it, and it highlights the class disparity there or what have you it was it was Big that vibes. And it basically just like fucking started that shit. Like all, a bunch of movies have been influenced by rules of the game. And you watch it and, you know, there's there's all this talk about the the deep focus that's used in it. Which at the time was like kind of special. It hadn't really been done like this very often or before or whatever. And it really sticks out. It's like its own fucking language. Like it's really its own visual fucking style. And the cinematography is really well done too. It's like writing, you know what I mean? Coverage and photography and film making, in my opinion, is just like writing. You are telling a story. You are placing blocks of a story together with hopes that it assembles into a coherent thing. God damn it, visually Jean Renoir is a good writer. Like these long hallway shots, these sort of cuts between different groups of people in, in different, these all these different spaces of this like chateau. You know, the cinematography with the animals matching the cinematography of the, the tragedy at the end. I don't know what else to say. It looks fucking sick, dude. If I could describe it one way, like, it would be not healthy. Sick. Ill. Anyhow, sometimes you really just gotta, about a film, you really just gotta go, yo, the vibes are just fire. Like, I really don't know what to tell you. Like, the vibes are fire. Like, we can really sit here and, and pluck out rules of the game historically and get all the context here. I'm probably not smart enough to fully do that, but we could fucking do that. We could have way smarter people chime in on this, but ultimately all they're going to be saying really is that the vibes are fucking sick because he's a genius director and he's ahead of his time. And ultimately when you are a good director and you're a good artist, period, your best works don't need all that. They can just be felt and you feel this film. It's immensely sad in a way. And also deeply, deeply, deeply beautiful. Like, it is really one of those films where people get really ugly and then there's like a beauty to them later. You know what I mean? Like there's, or just not, not specifically that, but like that thing where you just get a whole spectrum. You get a whole spectrum of humanity in this film. Very, very good. And so I saw that at the Anthology Film Archive and dude, I saw it on 35 millimeter, which, you know, Film, it's like, it's a big debate. It's not a big debate. A lot of people glaze film because it's just, it's more luxurious, period. It's more expensive. It's harder to do. So goddamn expensive. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous to shoot and process film. It is ridiculously expensive. Some directors are, that. that's why they, they prefer it. Like, if you talk to Scorsese or Spielberg, they're going to tell you they love digital. They love technology, which I understand because they're just trying to tell their story. And make it look good. They're more they're more concerned with getting the most performance, getting the most coverage, being able to make the best film. They don't want to leave. They they've been doing they've been doing that dance for decades. They don't want to do the fucking. Is it gonna come out looking good? Is it gonna is it gonna look good after the pro? You know, are the dailies gonna look good? They're tired of that. They don't want to do that. They want to they want to leave it in the hands of their cinematographer and sit next to the camera and fucking get a performance out of people and focus on telling the story. They don't want to do deal with film. 
But I have always, always been a person who thinks film is worth it. I love film. Even when it's fucking dirty and bashed up. I love it. You know what I mean? And hey, look, if all we were shooting was film, if it wasn't so rare, yeah, maybe if a reel was really scuffed up and I'm in the audience and I paid to see a movie, I'd be like, this is fucking dog shit, dude. What the fuck? I'd be annoyed. But that's usually not the context that a film reel is fucked up. A film reel is fucked up usually when I'm seeing like rules of the game on like a fucking, you know, seven-year-old print. That's, that's when it's usually fucked up, which is fine. Because it actually isn't fucked up. I also saw, dude, I saw, this wasn't recently, so this is not part of the ones I'm going to talk about, but I saw a third man in 35 also, which looked fire. Dude, just seeing movies on film, I just can't get enough of it. I, guys, <laughs> just, me personally, guys, just can't get enough of it. Okay? It's so, there's such a beauty to it to me. Even if it's a dupe of a dupe of a dupe, I just, the fact that it's on film, something about that, something about that's real special to me, you know? And I'd never been to Anthology Film Archive, and it looked really, it looked really great. And I had a great seat. It was a great picture, and it was really great to see. And it was one of those pictures which puts me into this manic film spell where I start watching a bunch of films. This happens a lot. I remember when I saw the conversation a couple of years ago. I hadn't been watching a lot of films, and I went and saw the conversation at IFC, I think, or maybe it was Film Forum. I think it was Film Forum, and I saw the IFC. I saw the conversation. Also, I. Th think on film as well and uh that fired me the fuck up because dude that's one of my favorite movies of all time actually is the conversation that movie's so good you could argue that that's better than one of the godfathers maybe or like apocalypse now you could you could argue that's his best film you could argue that i'm not saying you'd be right necessarily but you could argue but that's what rules of the game did so after i saw rules of the game i was fired up I sat down on my computer and I kind of financially foolishly bought a bunch of tickets to movies the last week. One of them I didn't end up seeing because there was a fucking fire on the tracks and a fucking traffic jam. And I literally would have just been 20 minutes, 30 minutes late to it. So I had to just take the L, which sucked because I really wanted to see it. But I should have left much earlier for it. I left on time, but not early. The other one I saw, Drowning by Numbers from 1988, directed by Peter Greenaway. Now this one... Shout out to my boy, Elliot. He was eulogizing the late Bernard Hill, who you might remember as King Theoden from The Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers. And he is in this film. And uh, I didn't know that. And I had been familiar with Peter Greenaway. Uh, I think it's like, what is, what is it? The Draftsman something? Dra draftsman? The Draftsman's Contract. And The Cook, The Thief, The Wife, and Her Lover. Those were the other two films I was familiar with. I hadn't seen them, but I was familiar with them. But not this one. I had not, I had not heard of this one. I like responded to, to my boy's story because he was mentioning all the films he was in because he was in this one. And I was like, oh, shit, this movie looks wild. And I was like, I love these fucking you know, little retrospectives you do. And he was like, oh, dude, Peter Greenway's great. And... I have to say, it's just the most simple way. It's probably over simple. I think it's being cheeky, but it really is true. <laughs> it's basically Wes Anderson for adults. It's like Wes Anderson if there was a lot more like chubby, short penises and fat British dudes and like murder. I think what Peter Greenaway does that's a little bit stronger in these movies is he kind of evokes emotional. There's sort of, there's, there's, there's a, a real mystery, a real dreamscape to his films that Wes Anderson doesn't really have. There is a comforting, almost like homey vibe to Wes Anderson films. Peter Greenaway's films feel like you are in a dream out on the edge of the sea and you're looking out at a blood orange sunset and all of a sudden you look down and a bunch of crabs are wet crawling over your feet on the on the sand that's in between your toes. Like You know what I mean? So that's how I describe it. And this movie is like a weird, witchy, fucking bizarre. It ju you just have to see it to, to really understand it. I mean, there's just like a scene where two people are like fucking in a fucking apple orchard tub filled with water. And there's like cuts to like close ups of like, like fucking fruit with snails crawling over it. And there's like glossy lighting on it. It's like crazy, bro. 
It's a crazy movie. I highly recommend peeping that one. I watched that one at home. That one I didn't go see. That one I just really locked in and watched at home. I watched it with my girlfriend, actually. It was a good time. And that was one of three movies I watched. Two of them were in theaters, but I saw one movie three days in a row. First one was Drowning by Numbers. Then I saw the Robert Altman film Three Women in theaters, which was crazy. That one's been on my list for a minute. I love Robert Altman. Jeez, I've seen fucking McCabe and Mrs. Miller, fucking Nashville, fucking Shortcuts, fucking The Player. I've seen The Player like three times. That's like such a great movie. It's one of my favorite movies. Um, Goddamn, what else? I've probably seen other shit, to be honest. I haven't seen Match. Oh, The Long Goodbye I've seen. But I hadn't seen Three Women and uh, just incredible. The performance he gets out of Shelley Duvall. Yo, the way they were like casting Shelley Duvall in the 70s. It's so interesting how you'd think she has this like weird airy quality that almost sounds like a like a TV actress. It doesn't sound real in a way, but yet she's able to get these performances in these really psychologically intense and realistic films such as The Shining and also this that it's just like wow. It's wild that they saw this in her. And it's true. She really is a... I think she's great. Like, the, the fucking... The, f- the fucking... Like, just silence she's able to bring to it. And just her glares and her her little, like... Her little glances. And and I know that's funny to say because she's talking throughout the whole fucking movie. But just, like, her little... Her little moments, her little beats, her acting, like, her performance. There is a real... There's something really deep going on there. Because like, she's she's just able to... Directors are also able to have these really strange scenes. The the, the scene where she she gives helps that lady give birth. And then, you know, towards the end. Oh my God. Horrifying. Horrifying. Honestly, maybe more horrifying than anything in The Shining. You know what I mean? Just sickening in a weird way. Maybe not sickening, really unsettling, really disturbing. But the whole film has his signature technical qualities, the fucking zooms and the perfect fucking, you know, just edits and assembly and and just the casual sort of treading, you know, pace of it. Slowly, slowly showing us that there's like some tension building between these two main characters and their lives and how they're intertwining and oh my God. Just phenomenal. That's the type of that's the type of shit we want because it's you're you're fucking creating sparks, you're creating narrative sparks, which evokes a whole other thing. It creates a whole other thing in us mentally when we fucking watch movies like this, and it's not spelled out so great for you. It's funny, even movies where they spell it out great for you, like fucking Tar, for example, people will get all all their panties twisted all fucking up in a bunch about some shit about that movie. Well, that movie's fucking brilliant. So when you can narratively get into these places where things make sense by not making sense, Lynch does this all the fucking time. They have that estrangement, like where a perfectly normal thing feels just there's just like a horrifying chaos in it. There's just like a, there's just like it feels completely alien. It's like you're staring into the void. That's the vibe. That's the vibe we want. Don't you understand? And this film, for me, does that and then does more on like a weird, witchy, spiritual level and emotional level. It's just, it's you. It's another one where you just like, I don't know, the best films are like this. You have to watch it to understand it. You just have to watch it to get it. I can't really spell this shit out. Okay. The last film I saw was by the GOAT, Andre Tarkovsky. If you've seen his films... You know he's not fucking around. He's the god. He's really the god. He'll give you that technical proficiency. He'll give you everything. Beautiful poetry. Beautiful visual sonnets. It's a fucking landscape of the conscious. Of consciousness. Of memory. Of loss. Of sheer, of the sheer utter loss and disintegration of time. How we lose things over time. How we only die, potentially. Not ever live, but only die. We only feel, in retrospect, all the times we were more alive. It's 
fucking heartbreaking. It's also fucking beautiful. It's also fucking not heartbreaking necessarily. I'm just interpreting it like that. You know, it's just like, it is crazy. Fucking motherfuckers uh, try to say that movie's like indiscernible plot wise. It's just a, it's just a boy who grew up and his fucking daddy went to war. Is it that fucking complex? He was stupid. You know, he struggled. He struggled with his grades, you know, and his mom might have, might have on the side. We don't know. We can't be certain. You know, we can't be certain. We can't be certain. Um, yeah, man, Mirror from 1975. Uh, some of the most beautiful shots in any film I've ever seen. At least in color. Yeah, I don't know how he made the... Films fucking look like that. That's like, that's my biggest takeaway every time I see him. I'm like, I don't, I don't know how he fucking made him look like that. Yeah. Making films in the 70s and making it look like fucking you, you shot it in the 2010s on film. <laughs> how? <laughs> how did you shoot that? That looks like it was shot in the 2000s. <laughs> how did you do that? Ah, mm -hmm. fucking George A. Rayberg, who didn't even do other Tarkovsky's except for Stalker, but I think he he did like half of Stalker. He didn't do all of Stalker. There's three cinematographers credited for Stalker, which I understand because that movie's long, isn't it? Mirror was made just four years before Stalker. I mean, Buddy was just cooking, bro. I don't know what to tell you, man. Andrei Tarkovsky. There should be a museum somewhere where the entirety of Mirror is playing on a loop on 35s against some sort of projection screen. Or a theater you can walk in. And there should be like a, a whole wall analyzing the film. Like a whole, a whole ride up. Because it's beautiful and I probably got some of this shit wrong, I said. Who fucking knows? Once again, another film where it's like, you genuinely need to watch this shit. More than watch, you need to experience these films. This is why I go to the theater, y'all. Like, this is why it's important to go to the theater. It's a different thing, man. And I mean both theaters, really. Like, plays and, and films on film. You need to do that more. Lock in. Go to the theater. You need to have less interrupted and short-form artistic experiences. Media consumption experiences. It's good to sit there. And experience a film. Feel yourself get fucking bored. Feel yourself get antsy. Feel yourself being like, fuck. I have to sit here quietly and not look at my phone for another hour. Feel that. Sit in that. Live with that. It's a beautiful feeling. It's beautiful. I fucking love it. Fucking love it. Because it puts you in the... F All you have is the film. You are disintegrated. But anyways, guys, I don't know how long, I didn't expect to be yapping for this long, but if you are subscribed, I really appreciate it. We're almost at 4,000. Shit, we're almost at 5,000, really. That's that's not that far away. 5,000 is really the first big milestone, in my opinion. Yeah, just really appreciate y'all. Love y'all. Join the Discord. Follow my letterbox as well. It's at Moschino Dorito if you want to fucking. I post like a couple hundred word review for every movie I see, and I usually see about like five movies a month. I think you will like it if you like hearing me app about movies. I think you'll enjoy following my film journey. I also have merch, which is, there's a link in my bio for merch. And, and also, uh, I have a 20% off code for Ewin Gaming Chairs. Peep those also. For now, guys, it was, it was a fucking beauty. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you guys enjoyed the fucking YouTube video. But I'll see you fucking next week, alright? Love you guys.